Hi, I'm Devin C. Larson, and welcome back to part three of how to record voiceover in Audacity. So a quick recap. Audacity is this amazing free software that you can use to record professional sounding voiceover tracks for fun and or profit. Part one was a general overview of the interface, including how to set your recording levels, the volume of your recording. Part two was the real meat and potatoes of the whole thing, how to actually record yourself along with some basic steps that you can take to edit around mistakes. Handy stuff, because those mistakes will happen. I'll include a link to both videos in the description below. All of which leads us to part three, editing your voiceover. And yeah, I know I just said that I covered some editing stuff in the last one. That was all in service of preparing your raw audio prior to adding any effects or altering it to make it sound different. I'm going to show you some basic steps that you're going to want to take to improve the overall quality of your sound, along with the process for exporting your audio for delivery. One thing that I want to stress when it comes to editing your voiceover, less is more. There are all these effects that you can apply to your voiceover after you've recorded it, and the temptation is going to be to over-process it, which is a mistake. The more effects that you pile on, the less natural it's going to sound, and the actual audio engineers will be able to tell immediately, and they will not be happy. So leave stuff like EQing to the audio engineers, and just make sure you use a light touch. So we're going to pick right up where we left off the last time. Here's our audio track that we just recorded. And remember, we already edited out some mistakes without getting too Frankenstein about it. Again, it's always better to try and record as clean a take as you can so that things flow naturally. You don't want things sounding choppy and you also don't want to spend forever editing minutia. So at this point, I recommend a couple things. First, add around a second of room tone to the beginning and end of your track. Room tone is the background silence of the space where you're recording. To save time, I've already recorded some, but what you do is you hit record, you don't make any sound, and then add about a second of that silence to the beginning and end of your track. The reason is it just makes it easier to edit around for whomever you hand things off to. If this is for an audition, it's also generally a good idea to slate up front, which means you say your name, what part you're auditioning for, and if you have an agent. So for example, Hi, I'm Devin Larson, reading for Carlton Steakhouse, and I'm seeking representation. You can do this when you first record the track. You don't have to actually wait until the editing phase, but it's something I forgot to mention on the last video. So up here in the top menu under effects, you have this drop down with a whole lot of options. There's really only a couple that I'm going to suggest that you use on a regular basis though. Light touch, remember? The first is called normalize. And what normalize does is it adjusts the volume of whatever you select in a proportional way so that the peak or loudest part is set to whatever level you specify and everything else adjusts accordingly. So for example, click on the name in the field above your clip to select the whole thing, go up to Effects, Normalize. Make sure the first two boxes are checked. The first one is going to center your baseline at 0.0, .0 just in case your waveform got misaligned. The second one, Normalize Peak Amplitude, is the important one. So remember back in part one where I went over how decibels work and how a good baseline recording volume is between negative 12 and negative 18 with a peak around negative six? Well, now that we've recorded our track, we wanna make the whole thing just a touch louder overall. So what I recommend is you set peak amplitude here to negative three. That's going to make the whole thing louder without risking anything clipping or distorting because it got too loud. So that's step one, normalize. There are some other ways that you could go about adjusting your volume. For instance, you could go up to Effects, Amplify, and amplify the entire thing by a set amount, and then Effects, Limiter, to bring down the peaks of the waveform, sort of like setting a noise ceiling. I don't recommend that you do that over Normalize, though. For one thing, it's multiple steps instead of just one step. Plus, you can end up clipping when you amplify, and then your peaks sound weird even when you pull them back with Limiter. I do want to go over a second way that you could normalize, though. It's called... RMS Normalize. This is a way to adjust the overall volume in a proportional way, but instead of doing it relative to the peaks, it's adjusting that baseline volume. It's mainly a thing when it comes to audiobook recording and submitting to ACX, the Amazon Creative Exchange. The reason is ACX has some very specific requirements, and one of those is an RMS level, that baseline volume, between negative 18 and negative 23 decibels. RMS Normalize is an optional plugin. You're not going to find it in the list, but you can download it and I'll include the link in the description. Similar to regular normalize, what you do is you select the RMS level that you want 
and then it adjusts the entire waveform proportionally. It's really only something that I recommend that you do if you're submitting to ACX, but it can come in handy. Most of the time though, just use regular normalize. Okay, so we've adjusted our volume, but let's say you've got some noticeable breaths or noises that you want uh, to get rid of in the recording. Here's an example of poor breath control. What I would recommend you do in this instance is reduce the volume of those breath sounds without completely getting rid of them because dead silence is just going to sound unnatural. So zoom in and select this section with the breath. And then you're going to apply normalize to this, but this time you're going to set the peak amplitude of this section to negative 53. And it's going to make the entire thing quieter without having it be dead silent. So when you play back the clip, Here's an example of poor breath control. You don't hear it anymore. Use this cautiously though. Ideally, you're going to want to eliminate breath sounds with better mic placement and mic technique rather than tinkering with the volume later. But if you have a breath and you need to soften it and get rid of it, that's how you'd go about that. Okay, so what about other stuff like weird mouth clicks or pops? Here's an example of uh, mouth noise. Lovely. <laughs> So everything gets magnified when you normalize, and all these weird little sounds that you never noticed suddenly jump out at you. Whenever possible, just select the weird little click or blip, and then delete it. And that's just going to get rid of it entirely. Um, that's the simplest way to deal with it. Uh, what if it appears in the middle of a word or sound, though? That's when things get tricky. You can go in manually and delete it, but in order to not introduce another random weird click, you have to make sure that you match the waveform at the beginning and end of your selection. And you do that by making sure that they pass at the 0, 0.0 mark at the same point, such that when you delete the click, the waveform continues uninterrupted and it doesn't have any weird spikes or anything. So then when you play that back, no click. Um, it's tricky. I don't recommend you do that if possible. What you can do is you can apply something called a declicker. It's another optional effect, uh, so check the video description for the link. And what it does is it analyzes your selection for any clicks and then removes them while preserving the waveform. At least that's what it does in theory. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. These are my declicker settings, and it sets the threshold for the effect and the number of steps or intervals that it uses to rebuild the waveform. Feel free to experiment a little, but like I said, use this sparingly. If you go overboard, your vocals can start sounding artificial and weird, and nobody wants that. But if you apply, and you play back, it just deleted that little click without making any kind of weird sound, so it works sometimes. All right, so let's talk about sibilance, shall we? So nobody likes hissing S's. No, they don't. So sibilance is the sharp hissing sound that you can make when pronouncing your S's. It has to do with how your tongue forms the sound, how loud or how long you hold it, etc. It's a fairly common thing. Most people do it and they don't really think about it until they hear it on a recording and then it's the type of thing that you can only hear all the time constantly. So the type of microphone that you use can contribute to the intensity of the sound, along with your distance from the mic. It's a real bastard to deal with. The best way to get rid of sibilance is to retrain yourself not to do it, but this involves fighting against muscle memory and it can take you a really long time to fix. So what else can you do? Well, similar to the D-Clicker, there's a plugin called a DSer, and it does what you probably think it does. It reduces the harshness of your S's in a given selection by tweaking the waveform and reducing the volume. The link with the D-Clicker also has the DSer plugin. It's also an optional plugin. These are my settings. Feel free to adjust them as needed. Again, I would use this sparingly. If you go overboard, you start to sound like you have a lisp. Do whatever you can to try and eliminate your sibilance before you record, but in a pinch, you know, the DSer plugin's there. So if I hit apply, you can see that it reduced the volume of the sound of all my S's. And if I play, so nobody likes hissing S's. You can tell the difference, but some of those started to sound like a lisp because it just applied those settings 
to the entire thing. Uh, it's a very tricky plugin. You don't want to go overboard with it. So another effect that I wanted to point out that you might get some use out of from time to time is called change tempo. So let's say that you're recording a commercial spot and you need it to come in at exactly 30 seconds and your recording is 32 seconds. What change tempo is going to do is compress the time of the entire clip, speeding everything up. It's something that you can try in a pinch if you need to make the clip just a tiny bit shorter, but anything more than that and it's going to sound like you're playing something at two times speed, which is weird. So if possible, re-record yourself and try to get the read done a little faster rather than rely on this effect, but it's there if you really need to tweak your timing just a little bit. The last effect that I want to show you is something called noise reduction, and it's a two-step process. So it's under effects, noise reduction. First, you're going to want to select a part of your room tone that you recorded earlier and use that as a sample so that it can build a noise profile based on the background sound of that recording. So then in your main clip, if you want to delete that kind of background tone, that hum, those weird sounds in the background, you go into effect noise reduction and since you already took the noise pro profile from the room tone, then you use these settings and you hit OK, and it'll go through and try and remove that background noise. Um, it's uh, something that you want to be very careful with. I don't recommend that you use it. It's, it runs the risk of making your track sound unnaturally silent, and it can mess with your waveform and make it sound like there are pieces missing but every once in a while it can be useful. Just don't rely on it. And that's everything I would recommend that you do to clean up your track prior to exporting it. If possible, just normalize and then delete any weird clicks or run the de-clicker or de -er as needed. That's all I would do. So next is exporting. Go to File, Export, and you have the option of selecting the format that you want your track to be you're probably going to want to stick to MP3 or WAVE. WAVE is uncompressed and it's going to sound better, but it also retains a larger file size. So most of the time you're going to want to export as .mp3, which is a much smaller file and a good compromise on sound quality. Always though, refer to the project specifications and use whatever format that they ask for. But if they don't specify, go with MP3. Audacity is going to export whatever is unmuted, so just be aware of that. So then you're going to have the option to name your file and select your destination. With audition tracks, I tend to put my first and last name, the word audition, and then whatever the name of the project is. You can figure out what consistent method works for you. Just keep it consistent so that you can keep naming files, naming consistent and uh, keep things clear. So hit save, and then you have the option to enter metadata for the MP3, which I do to keep things organized. I include my name, the name of the track, the year, if it's some kind of genre like an audiobook or something, and then go ahead and hit OK, and it'll save it, and that's really all there is to it. From there, you're just going to want to upload your file to the wherever the client wants it, be it a P2P site or Dropbox or some other file sharing thing. And there you have it. Start to finish the entire process of recording and editing voiceover in Audacity. I hope you found the series useful. VoiceOver is a very do-it-yourself kind of craft, but as I've demonstrated, the actual process is pretty straightforward. There's nothing crazy complicated about Audacity. It's free. So long as you have the equipment, there's really nothing stopping you from jumping in and recording yourself, which I recommend you do. Now is the time. Get to it. I believe in you. Thanks again for watching. Your support means a lot, so like, subscribe, do the whole thing, and comment. If you found this video useful, let me know. If you have any questions at all, uh, post them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. We're all in this together, you know. See you next time.